All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Daily Space for today, September 18th, 2019. I am your host, Annie Wilson, and as always, I have two dogs. I will try my best to mute out their barking. I make no promises. Look, the sound alerts are working. All right, just for that, we have to turn the doggy cam back on. Because holy crap, dogs. Give me one second to find their camera. Hey, 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 hey. And make it rain! So, um, yeah, if you would like to hear later a clean recording of this without a whole bunch of dogs barking and random interruptions, we do a podcast. I don't promise what time I'll be done with that recording today because there's a lot going on today. We'll talk about that after the show. But, um, yeah, yeah, if you're not particularly keen about handing, hearing random dog barks, there is a podcast. So, one more fistful of Cheerios for the dogs, and make it rain! Yes, so thank you for those bits, Wayne Johnson. Puck says thank you, I say thank you, yeah! Planetary Pan says, on one hand, they've been well trained to respond to the camera. On the other hand, they're terrible about barking when not asked but they are cute af they are cute af i i just can't control my neighbors who like to honk their horns this might be a a, a a pet peeve of mine larry weird says i like the random cat meows yes if you're new there's also a cat that i just fed so he should he should be all right for now he should be all right for now <laughs> okay so with that all being said and done let's move on to to the news. Uh, you can ask questions during, uh, while I'm talking. I just ask that you at me, and if you know how to pull up the purple star, pull up the purple star and add that to your um, question. Both of those things makes it easier for us to spot where there's questions, and because uh, I have to scroll way back up through the chat while I talk. So, yeah. All right. Puck, are we ready to do this? We're ready to do this. He's like, where's my Cheerios, human? No Cheerios for you. All right, so first up, we're gonna talk about the things that launched. So give me one second while I find all the things. So we're gonna talk about the things that launched. On September 12th, so that was almost a week ago, uh, there was a Zen Yu, no, I'm sorry, a Zhu Yen. Two Delta mission with co-passengers B and U, that's Bravo November Uniform 1 and Taurus 1, launched on a long march for Bravo at 3.23 UTC. Thankfully, China's like plus UTC 8, I think. So for them, it was like 11 a.m. Uh, we talked about the BNU 1 payload last week, so I'm really going to chat a, a little bit about the other two payloads, and yes, yes, there is a launch video, and yes, it's a Chinese mission, so yes, there is gratuitous wreckage photos, so hold on, but first we're going to talk about, you know, the mission and the payloads, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. So first up is the mission patch for this particular mission. Um, I really don't understand a whole lot of it. As usual, mission patches tend to have a lot of symbolism behind them. But this is a circle with uh, Charlie Alpha Sierra Charlie cask, which is probably who built the rocket and who may have built the satellites. Um, cask, there's 2019.9 for year 2019, month of September. And then there's CZ, Charlie Z, dash four Bravo, uh, Yankee 39. So the Charlie Z is simply the Chinese words or the Chinese name for the long march. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Um, just know that when we call it a long march, and you see it abbreviated as Charlie Zed, Zed or Charlie Zulu, it's it's fine, it's fine. Um, and the Y-39 was probably the mission number, and I 
believe that's the case because of the, what I'm assuming is the main payload, because this is the largest payload that was on there. You're, right now you're looking at a photo of people with the Zhu Yen satellite. Uh, the Zhu Yen 102 Delta is a remote sensing satellite that will acquire high resolution panchromatic and multispectral imagery for things like land resource surveys, disaster monitoring, and monitoring of forests and other ecosystems. And yeah, this was the main payload. This is why um, BNU didn't launch when I thought it did, because it, it, it was essentially a co-passenger with this main passenger, along with another small uh, CubeSat. So the other CubeSat, the other small sat that went up with this mission is called the Taurus-1. It is a three-unit CubeSat. Um, if you're not sure what 10 centimeters looks like because each unit is about a 10 centimeter cube that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters take a dollar bill us dollar bill fold it in thirds unfold one part and two thirds of a dollar bill is roughly the same size as one unit um of a three unit satellite so I'm trying to do math. Would it be? Would it be? It's a little more. I don't know. I can't do math right now and I didn't work it out ahead of time. But yeah, just take three dollar bills, fold them in thirds, unfold one so you have two thirds of a dollar bill, line them up. That's about how long the satellite is. It's not very long. Um, and it's a three by one, so it's not very tall either. Uh, so, anyways, the Taurus one is a three U, three unit CubeSat that's really not going to be in space for very long. It will be used to test a 2.5 square meter drag sail to accelerate deorbiting. This will be useful for helping clear uh, space debris out of orbit, especially CubeSats with like really short missions. Also on board is an amateur radio system that provides telecommand or telemetry, and I guess it actually does broadcast a ping or a signal. So if you do have the equipment, there is a way. Uh, for you to try to pick it up. Um, I don't know all the details of that, unfortunately, but I I believe you can find the in the information out there on the interweb somewhere. I am not as up as I used to be on my amateur radio stuff. So, so, now I've got the stuff you all have been waiting for. So here is a launch photo. Um, and... Um... Yeah, it's taken from a good deal. And yes, there's video, so <laughs> I'm watching all of the uh, the chat. 10 centimeter cubed is equal to one liter. It's magic. Yeah, yeah. So the volume of that little cube set is indeed a th three liter soda bottle. That's one way to think of it. I don't think it weighs that much. It probably weighs more. Um, all right. So here's the launch photo. And yes, and yes, here... Here's the launch video. Warning, launches are loud. Here's them, you know, working with the, the rocket in pieces. This is the fairing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there you had it. That was the launch. Um, kind of short and sweet. Nothing much to it. And, um, that there, you did see, hey, 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 hey. So let me go back up. So you can't see it in this photograph. Let me turn on my pointer. You can't see it in this photograph, but in the video, there was some debris flying off of this. 
I don't know what that debris was. I don't think I've seen anything about what it was. Um, so yeah, but, uh, and you can't really see it in this photo. You can kind of see it here. Uh, the fuel used for this rocket is that UDMH and N204. So UDMH is um, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Yes. So what exactly is that? So this is my little molecular molecule uh, model. And the hydrazine part are these two blue balls right here. Hydrogen, or no, these are nitrogen. Blue is nitrogen, white is hydrogen, and black is carbon. So the hydrazine portion is the nitrogen, and the methyl portion is this black with the white. So here's a methyl group and here's a methyl group. So dimethyl, two methyls, hydrazine, this part, unsymmetric. They're only on this side and not on that side. So this is the fuel and the oxidizer is this uh, N204, which I can't remember what it's called. I'm sure it's somebody saying something about in chat. Um, again, there's two nitrogen in here. I'm not sure if this is considered a hydrazine group and there are four oxygens and oxygen likes to have two bonds. Nitrogen likes to have three. You will notice that this is not a complete, I can't even tell if this is on camera properly. I know, I know everything's weird. It might be a little difficult to see. I think maybe if I do it in front of my shirt. Yeah, there we go. But this is not a complete uh, double bond to the nitrogen. It's a partial bond. That's because this charge in the bond is split between these three atoms and the same on this side as well. So this is, pretty reactive stuff. It, it doesn't take much for this to react with anything. And both of these are pretty toxic. You, you don't want any, uh, you don't want, you don't want about be around these. The reason why it's still used is because it's the best hybrid between fuel, between liquid fuel and solid fuel. It's stable and can be stored and it, the rocket doesn't have to be continuously fueled, but it is pretty bad for people and the environment. So just the, and that's, that's a whole bunch of explanation of why you see a whole bunch of yellow and red and orange from Chinese rocket launches and a few other countries rocket launches. Okay. So yeah, we talked about that and now back to the, uh, the wreckage photos. So here we have on the left, on the left, that is indeed a payload fairing half with humans for scale. You know, the humans kind of hanging out here. There's a human hanging out here, there's a human head. But yeah, this whole thing is a payload fairing half. Not gonna joke. And this on the right is indeed one of the engines from the rocket. Uh, I don't think any injuries were reported I don't think uh, any damage was recorded. You can see kind of how hard this hit. There are other images out there, but it's definitely disturbed the dirt. It broke this root right here. I mean, when this stuff comes down, it's no joke. Um, they, what happens when this, what happens when wreckage does hit is that uh, the local authorities are contacted and they do come out and they cordon off the area and they keep the people safe. And I, I imagine that it's cleaned up, uh, but people often get to it first before the authorities, because how else is it going to get reported and people take images of it, which somehow inexplicably make it to the internet. This is a, this is a, kind of a tiny bit disturbing for me. The reason why we see this with Chinese launches is because their uh, launch sites are very, very far inland compared to uh, like most of the US's that are on coastlines. So we typically dump our first stages in the ocean and all of our fairing bits and things like that end up 
in the ocean. China has a big spot of land. Big spot of land. All around it. And they actually put out evacuation orders and things of that nature for falling space debris. This is a regular, normal thing. Well, normal-ish. But this is a, a part of, you know, space life in China. Or not space life. But this is a part of, you know, space flight in China, I guess. Is that things fall from the sky. And hopefully nobody gets hurt. Anyways. Anyways. Let's move on to the things that are launching. So the things that are launching are China again tomorrow at 0600 hours, 37 minutes. That is AM UTC. They are launching a bunch of Earth observation satellites. This is multiple satellites from one constellation. I am going to try my best to pronounce them or pronounce the mission. I make no promises. So I'm going to go with Zohai 1 and it is going to launch an OVS-2 Bravo and four OHS-2. So that's Oscar Victor Sierra-2 Bravo and four Oscar Hotel Sierra-2 on a long March 11. And this is going to be the third group of this, you know, group of remote sensing satellites. And they will be part of a commercial constellation for the Zuhai Orbita Aerospace Science and Technology Company. So here is what I was able to find of the satellites. So on the left, there's the Oscar Victor Sierra-2 which is a video satellite with the resolution of just under a meter. And that one weighs 90 kilograms Americans. That's 45 two liter soda bottles. Um, it also is going to be able to capture video with uh, frames per second of 25 and about two minutes of video. And it transmits data back at 300 megabits. Shh megabits per second. Um, and then the hyperspectral satellite or the Oscar Hotel Sierra group, they are a bit smaller. It's 67 kilograms Americans. That's let's go with 34 two liter bottles, more or less. Um, and they will just take images, no video and it says it has a spatial resolution of 10 meters and a spectrum range of all the way from 400 nanometers to 10, no, not 10,000, 1,000 nanometers. And a spectrum resolution of 2.5 nanometers, 32 bands. Has the same data transmission rate of 300 megabits per second. So yeah. Yeah. Um, they're kind of small, which is able why they're able to launch so many at once. So it's neat. Yay, more remote in sensing satellites. That's really all I have for this group. Um, so China again. <laughs> I wonder if China's winning the space race this year. I should probably look that up before the podcast. Um, China again is launching on September 24th at an unknown time. This will be two more satellites for the Beidou navigation satellite system. So this is going to be a pair of third generation Beidou navigation satellites. After this pair is in orbit, there will be 12 more Beidou satellites launched and the rest of them are all third generation. Beidou, for those that don't know, is China's equivalent of GPS, um, LONAS, Galileo, things of that nature, or things of that nature. It's it's literally global satellite navigation. That's that's all it is. So this pair and one future pair do have an additional payload called Copas Sir Sat. I believe I pronounced that correctly. The International Copas Sir Sat program supports search and rescue operations by detecting and locating emergency beacons 
The location of the distress beacon is then forwarded to authorities who go out and rescue the people that activated the beacon. Between September 1982 and December 2017, over 46,000 people were rescued with the help of this program. And that number is actually less than what it actually is because they don't always get a notification back of when people were rescued using this system. So the best part about this is that this service is provided at zero cost to the distress beacon owners or the countries that the signal is forwarded to. This is an international program that is actually out to do, you know, greater good, which is super cool. Um, we might talk about it in the future if we have a slow launch week, but I thought it was worth mentioning that this is a thing. It does exist. These beacons work for, you know, uh, people in remote locations on land, at sea, and in the air. So, yeah. It's pretty cool. Alright, so the next launch that's coming up is September 25th at 1300 hours, 57 minutes UTC. And it has people on it! So the Soyuz MS-15 for Expedition 6162 is going up on a Soyuz FG. <sighs> Make it rain. They're crying. So for a brief period of time, there are going to be nine people and five toilets, but really only two on the ISS for a week. Dave wasn't sure about my math. So here's how I got the math for the nine people. I think there are, there are three people going up. There's six people um, up there right now. So that's, that one's easy. There's nine. But five toilets, okay, let's break that down. There's two toilets on the ISS. Those are the toilets that are going to be used. And they're going to be not one, not two, but three different Soyuz docked to the ISS. Russia has a total of four docking ports. So yes, they can do this. Um, the MS-12 is still docked. The MS-13 is docked. And the MS-15 is what's going up. MS-14 had, you know, a robot in it, which has already come back down to Earth. Um, yeah, that's how I got five toilets, people. And yes, toilets matter. But this is only going to be for a week. And um, yeah, this is not, this is also not the most people that have been on the ISS at once. All right, so now that we got some of the toilet talk out of the way, uh, this is a beautiful slide put together by Dave. Um, the image is a liftoff of Soyuz 2.1 Alpha rocket, uh, December 27th, last, last year, December 27th. And it is carrying a pair of uh, remote sensing satellites and it essentially had 28 sat uh, satellites. So essentially Russian rocket like this one will launch humans into space. Just instead of the payload at top, it will be a Soyuz craft. Yes, both the craft and the rocket are named Soyuz. I know it's confusing. The patch, let's talk about the patch. So there are three people going up, someone from Russia, someone from the US and I believe Saudi. If I get this wrong, please correct me. It's either Saudi or uh, UAE. Um, one last name written in Latin characters. One, one last name written in Arabic characters and one last name written in Cyrillic. So you have the moon. MC-15, really, trust me, that's MS-15 outline or art of the Soyuz craft that they'll be on, outline of the ISS, and a bird. And I don't know the significance of the bird. Jordan. Oh, no, they're saying UAE, not Saudi. Okay. Oh, it's a swallow. Okay. I don't know what the significance of the swallow is, but yeah, three different nations, one Russian craft. And I will probably have more details about, you know, the astronauts and cosmonauts that are going up for you next week. And we may or may not stream this launch. I make no promises because I think 
It's really early and y'all know I'm not a morning person. So, um, a definite note about this launch is that the rocket is going to fly in the... Oh, that's why he showed this rocket. Okay, I, I'm i tracking. I'm like, why is he showing this rocket? Why did he pick this image? <laughs> Are you done? Are you done yelling at me? I think the dog's young yelling with me. Um, so the reason why Dave picked this photo is because it is going to be this rocket that's going to be used for the first time of a Soyuz 2 variant on a crewed launch. So ignore the stuff I said earlier about a Soyuz FG. It's, it's essentially the important thing to remember. It's a Soyuz on a Soyuz, which I just always find amusing. Okay. And now, now on to the things that would keep humans alive. Because yes, these things matter. So this is an image of the Bravo 330 habitat. So, um, what is it? This is an expandable module that boasts, wait for it, 330 cubic meters of internal volume. That's a bit more than a third of the pressurized total volume on the ISS. So why are we talking about it? NASA has started ground tests on Bigelow Airspace's uh, Bravo 330 habitat. This is the last of the six prototype space stations to be evaluated in the second round of NASA's Next Step program. Bigelow is known for their expandable uh, habitats um, at launch. This particular habitat would be compressed to fit inside of a five meter wide payload fairing. Um, the expanded habitat diameter is 6.7 meters. So essentially they get them all squished down and compressed for launch. And when they're actually out in space or on another world, uh, it's would be expanded to its full size, which gives it more volume than a similar non-compressible uh, payload of its size. I hope that makes sense. So I don't really have a whole lot of pictures of the interior, partially because they're confusing, because right now they have the space station on Earth and there's gravity. So, there are beams inside of it that say this does not exist, which I found really confusing to my brain. So I was just like, nah, we're just gonna leave that out. Plus it didn't show you really how roomy it is. Um, it's pretty big. So, but of course, because somebody's going to ask me, yes, it has toilets, it has not one, but two space toilets. And this is an image of one of the lavatories. So this thing is big enough to have not one, but two lavatories inside of it, which is pretty cool. Um, this is not, this does and doesn't look like other space toilets I've seen before. Uh, I imagine the black hose across the front is for liquid waste and that you would lift this lid and uh, solid waste would essentially go there. So yeah, yeah. DPI says this looks potty. Nice pun DPI, I approve. So yeah, uh, you may have heard Bigelow mentioned before. Oh, Hanny's asked, the blue stuff is like a seatbelt? Um, I think Hanny is talking about this blue strap and this blue strap. I really don't know. Um, I think these are handholds here. I really don't know what these blue straps are for. And it's hard to tell because everything's in gravity. This may, it may actually be, oh look, they're Velcroed. Um, as soon as I move the pointer away. They are Velcroed, it might be a place to put your feet. There might be another place to attach the Velcro somewhere else. I really don't know. This is the only, <laughs> the only image I've seen of their space toilets. But because, yeah, I like space toilets and somebody's going to ask me if there's toilets, I, I found a picture of the toilets. All right, so, um, 
DPI says, funny, all I could find for the MS-15 points to FG, but MS-16 is supposed to be a two-point alpha. Did they change it? You want know to I don't know. Um, the info on the slide is probably over a week old because I think Dave put that together for me last week. And it looked like he pulled the 2.1 Bravo info from, um, we'll just go back to it. It looks like he pulled the 2.1 Bravo info from uh, Spaceflight Now. So yeah, schedule blurb is from Spaceflight Now launch schedule. So if the next group is going up on the Soyuz uh, 2.1 Alpha, okay. I don't know. Dave says it's happening, so I'm going to go with what Dave says is happening. <sighs> Whatever number that is, yeah. All right. So anyways, you may have heard of Bigelow before, and that's because they already have an expandable module in space. In space. So this is the BEAM, the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, attached to the ISS and photos of it as, as it is expanding. Um, it was compressed to something that looked like this upon launch. And then, you know, as time went on, boom, it's a whole little spherical type thing. I think future plans are for it to act as an airlock, which would allow two or three people to go on an airlock at a time instead of just, or to go on a spacewalk at a time instead of just two. This is not a, um, this is not a spot where the astronauts and cosmonauts live. Um, they do access it for testing purposes and start cargo storage. It does hold a great deal of cargo. The hatch is closed otherwise. Um, I know they go in four times a year to test for radiation and um, other, you know, bits of that nature. But no, they don't. <coughs> they don't. Hey, she's like, you're, you're, you're digging in the Cheerios, mom. They don't live in it. Um, Dave writes, thank you, Dave. Despite the problems during its initial inflation blamed um, on the unexpectedly 10, unexpectedly long 10 month delay between construction storage and launch causing the fabric layers to stick together. The module was eventually fully inflated and will likely remain attached until at least 2020. Although testing has certified it as sound through 2028. NASA has two available one-year extension options of if available, which if, if exercised would take the module through 2020. Whenever the contract does end, the module will be detached and burned up in the atmosphere. None of it is expected to, re to survive re-entry. And it has about 16 cubic meters of storage space for Americans. He was kind and he provided, you know, American units. That is 565 cubic feet of storage space, enough for 130 of the large cargo bags used aboard the ISS and monitoring of the space for radiological hazards indicates that the module is as about as resistant to cosmic rays and the like as the rest of the station. Inspection has revealed that the module has suffered a small number of micrometeorite strikes, but it's also been at about the same rate as the rest of the station. And it has not suffered any loss of instructional integrity, nor ability, nor, yeah, nor the ability to maintain uh, internal pressure. So it's been hit like the rest of the space station. And even though the outer layers are made out of fabric and ex expandable, it's been a-okay. So it's been A-okay. Um, yeah. So, and I think that's pretty much all I have news wise for you. So while you write, you know, your questions and things of that nature, um, I'm just going to go through the wall of text. So this has been a production of PSI, that's Planetary Science Institute. 
I work in collaboration with Youngstown State University here in Youngstown. Is it fall yet, Ohio? PSI is a nonprofit 501c3 corporation, which is fancy speak for your donations are tax deductible where laws allow. Speaking of donations, we are brought to you by you. So thank you for all of your follows, subs, bits, pledges, merch purchases, donations. Thank you for all of it. That's what, you know, helps keep me paid. Thank you. We would not be here without you. Um, we stream Sunday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Right now that's 1700 hours UTC. Sundays is me, hi, uh, working with space telescope data, usually colorizing it. And Monday through Fridays is this, Daily Space, your you know, dailyish quick space in astronomy news update. And we archive everything, everything on YouTube. And we occasionally stream at other random times. Launches, landings, heat mapping, Bennu. Hate mapping Bennu um, and other random space news as we find fit and sometimes even coding. So yeah, yeah. <sighs> okay, okay. Now, we did all that. Have some Cheerios and dog love and make it rain. Okay, I think I got the wall of text. So yeah, I'm gonna scroll back up and read through uh, your questions. And oof. Oh, Damien Explorers popped in and I missed it. And I don't get all of the the things, so we may have lost. So Varek 3 asks, do you think chickens uh do you think chickens can fly on Titan in an isolated base? Titan has gravity. Is Titan solid? If Titan's solid and we can put a base there and we can give them life support, I think chickens can fly about as good as however chickens can fly on Titan. Chickens don't really fly. They, they flap their wings. They kind of can fly. They just don't fly really well um, or for very far. So... I'm going to say, yeah, I don't know what the gravity difference is between uh, Titan and here. So, um, Miss Town says about the things falling off of the Chinese rocket as it launched. I really thought I had muted that. Um, shh. <laughs> Um, it says about the Chinese rocket being launched and things falling off of it. They didn't want to paint it, so they just used white post-it notes to make it look painted. And DPI says, the things that were falling off was non-essential launch equipment. All right. They are not done. They are not done. Um, Kenny says about the Chinese fairing half that came back down to earth. Not a lot of room in that fairing for stowaways. No, not so much. Um, Mike Cassidy says Chinese are not doing soft landing with reusable parts. They've started to at least do controlled landing. But I don't think they're to the part to the point of doing reusable parts. It takes a while to build a rocket and then to get everything ready for the launch. There are many um, startup companies in China. I use startup in quotations because they're usually spin-offs of spin-offs. And they're the ones playing around with the newer technology, not so much the um, the old guard. I think the old guard is just going to continue using what works because if it works, why fix it? If it's not broken, why fix it? So, um, yeah. 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 I 
it's pronounced Beidou, not Beidou. Those remember the old art type video game series. Okay, I promise my pronunciation for Chinese things was not perfect, our instro. Um, Larry Weird says China has a GPS that the US cannot turn off. Correct, that is what um, Beidou, Beidou? Beidou, Beidou, not Beidou. Beidou, um, that is actually one of the reasons why they have their own global uh, satellite navigation system is so in case they ever lose access to the US GPS or Russian GLONASS or European Galileo, they still have something that acts like that. It is really, really one of the big reasons they have that. International corporate cooperation is great. Oh, thanks for the sub, Bombadil! Hey, oh. Make it rain! Make it rain! Um, it is probably one of the primary reasons they have it, and it I would imagine their system covers their country better because you know. For a while, I think Galileo was only covering, you know, Europe. I think GLONASS may have only covered Russia. More bits! More bits! Thank you for the bits! And make it rain! Puck's so happy. So yeah, that that is one of the primary reasons why there's so many is because nobody wants to lose access if somebody decides to turn it off. So. Um, Henny asks about the, the two toilets on the Bigelow Bravo 330 module. Oh, so much privacy. Which one is the basement toilet? I actually don't know where the latrines are located in the modules. So I'm not sure if they're like right next to each other, uh, not right next to each other, things of that nature. All right, and people are like, not sure over who is the humans in going to be the humans in space so i have a wiki, wiki link for that so the future expeditions um there's a quick way to do that he is from he is indeed from the uae he was a current occupation as an astronaut and previous occupation was a fighter pilot and it will not be his first time into space. I'm um, afraid to pronounce his name because I'm afraid I'll get it wrong. Um, oh, he's only going to be in space for eight days. So he's also only going to be in space for eight days. So let me scroll down to the bottom, which means I'm gonna have to scroll all the way back to the top. But that is going to be the uh, Emirati uh, astronaut. So, spacey bouncy house. Yes, Larry. I think the B three three O looks like a, a bouncy ha house too. And Bigelow was originally a hotels company. I did not know that, Russ Matt. Um. See, I think I already answered whether or not the blue stuff was a seatbelt. The Raven Lillian says, you know, space toilets alone seem like a good reason for me to stay here on Earth. Agreed. 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 Oh, um, first in, first out. I'm not sure why people are talking about first in, first out. Bits! More bits! Thank you, Wayne, for the bits. I'm just still scrolling. Um, Russ Matt says, I don't know what Soyuz rockets are still warehouse, but they have to fly out their existing units before they commence operations with the new style, otherwise it's a waste. Correct. Um, Raven Lillian asks about the Bigelow expendable module uh, attached to the space station right now. Could it be recompressed and moved, assuming there were multiple places in orbit for it to be set up? I really 
don't know if it can be recompressed and moved. I imagine it could be carefully moved uh, using the Canada arm, but because I think that's how it was installed to begin with, but I don't know if they would um, move it to a different location on the ISS. Uh, Hanny's asked about the beam also. Is it constantly pumped with air or is it using the same air that pumped it up in the first place? I imagine it's the same air that pumped it up in the first place. I very briefly read about it. Uh, let me see if we can find the answer quickly in the wiki. So, deployment and status. Do, 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 do. It was expanded over the course of seven hours with air being injected 25 times for a total of two minutes and 27 seconds. Oh, wow. Um... Hmm. It doesn't really say. I imagined that it's all the same air. I know they closed the the hatch to it. It's probably also to test it for you know leakage and things of that nature. Um that's all I can find about the um uh, being pumped up. So I think it's still using the same air that pumped it up in the first place. First measurements of interstellar comet didn't Dr. Pamela that's usually a Dr. Pamela thing, Wayne. Um eBay. eBay the old rockets maybe. I mean people would buy it. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. DPI says, I believe chickens fly. I believe chickens touch the sky. Star Strider adds, humans wearing chicken style wings can fly on Titan because thick atmosphere and low gravity. There you go, Varak. Chickens can fly on, on Titan and turkeys. And yes, turkeys do fly pretty well. Well, better than, you know. Yeah, there we go. Larry says, despite their weight, wild turkeys, unlike their domesticated counterparts, are agile, fast flyers. Oh, thank you, Veronica, for gifting a sub. And make it rain. The alert just pops up that, it's okay, fuck. The alert just pops up of who, who got the sub, not that you did it. So thank you for gifting the sub. Um, Larry Weird says, we breed our food to make it easy to catch. Yeah, we do. And Puck Tinker. Privacy in the ISS just doesn't happen. Correct. Tinker just let me know how she sees Puck, my poor ear. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks for the follow. Time to pain. Um, make it rain. I have Cheerios everywhere. Okay, so the beam is equalized to the ISS. It does not need yeah, extra pressure. And Hanny says it would be neat if the Bigelow modules can be put together like Lego bricks. Fun fact, they can. That's actually the idea. The module that they're doing the ground testing for now can be used both, um, excuse me, in orbit and um, on the ground. The setup that they have right now going, I think, is like their Mars experimental setup. So where it would have walkways and supports and other things needed for when there's gravity. Um, I think their next goal is to get it up for and be part of the gateway. They've had images and illustrations of different modules put together to create, you know, space stations on the ground, space stations in orbit using, you know, these large modules. So it needs like a kind of a connector piece 
like for plumbing, you could have, you know, multiple things like a, a T-joint, I guess, um, to connect multiple units together, but it's possible. So, um, Planetary Pan asks, where do they get the air to expand it? Arnstro says they inflate it independently, but once inflated, it is stable at normal station pressure. It has its own tanks. That's actually pretty cool. Bits from Wayne. More bits. Dogs are like, yeah. I think I'm getting down to the bottom. Lag Adder says, let's all take a ride in Mr. Wonka's space elevator. That would be terrifying. That would be terrifying. Um. Raven Lillian says, having slept on an air mattress for quite a while, I just feel like the bouncy room in space would get holes. Um, Raven Lillian, don't... <sighs> air mattresses will get holes if they're too inflated when you lay on them. So, and also if there's stuff underneath, which I'm sure you know that. So inflate it less than you'd think you'd need to. You don't want it to be firm, firm when you put your hand on it, because otherwise when you lay on it, um, the air has to go somewhere. And that pressure from, you know, the added mass on top of the air mattress is what cause, kind of causes holes. It'll look for weaknesses and then the air will just burst out from the additional pressure on the inside of the air mattress. So yeah. I totally get what you mean by air mattresses on the floor. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Heisenberg chickens fly when we aren't looking, says Mike Cassidy. Maybe the walls are puncture proof. The walls on the beam so far have acted like the walls on, you know, the rest of the ISS. So. Q corrects Mike. Nah, that's Schrodinger's chicken. Heisenberg chicken flies, but we don't know where. The average temperature on Titan is negative 180 degrees Celsius. No. No. Frozen birds don't fly. Correct. Correct. Ever heard of the Royal Canadian Air Face Chicken Cannon? Air Farce? Air Force? All right, I think that's a weird rabbit hole. We don't need to go down. Anyways. Are you guys ready for bits? Tinker speak? Tinker? I know you're over there. And... Ah! Ah! Oh, there we go. Make it rain. Um, is it a fun bounce room or an expansion a la Martian? Um, beam? Or the Bigelow expandable things. They're just expansion a la Martian. Uh. <laughs> Gluten-free space, I can't even. GFS says, someone should tell President Trump there's oil on Titan. Nah. Nah. Ah. <sighs> Oh my, this has just gone down a weird rabbit hole. Anyways, more Cheerios for the dogs. I am going to end up with purse Cheerios again. So, um, I mentioned there were things that were happening later, later today. Um, more bits, more bits. So I mentioned things that were happening later today in about an hour, um, either myself or Paranorm will be back and we are going to co-stream, simulcast, I'm really not sure, um, an escape room that is also on Twitch. It's supposed to be a really scientific -y space room and I've art or really scientific -y escape room. And I think they're also doing an interview with an astronaut. So yeah, uh, we're going we're going to simulcast stream co-stream i'm not sure what to call it they they've asked us to um to rehost it on not just rehost it on their channel but to rehost and have commentary and uh, 
I guess, ask questions in their channel, I really need to talk to, I feel like they're, I really don't know what's going on. We're, we're gonna try it. We're gonna see if this is what they want to happen. I'm a little confused as to why they want us to, to co-stream because that doesn't get them more viewers, but it sounds really cool. It sounds really cool and I'm looking forward to it. So that's gonna be in about an hour and even later today in probably six hours, there's the weekly space hangout. Um, do I have the link for the escape room? You actually just have to come here. Just come back here in an hour. Like I'm, I'm gonna probably eat food and then yeah, just come back here in an hour. We'll be back. I don't have any of this stuff handy and I already feel like I'm flailing. Um, Susie says, and if you've not subscribed to our Cosmo Quest YouTube channel, please do. Benu says, just mark two images on Benu and then come back. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in about an hour, we'll be back with the escape room and the um, astronaut interview. And later tonight is weekly space hangout, which I think Paranor is going to be in charge of simulcasting because food and I need to, you know, record the podcast and things. Uh, Benu, Benu, for all of you that are already registered. Oh, George is going to be up with, and with Gozer. <gasps> Gozer's adorable. Gozer is adorable. Oh my goodness. Um, anyways, Bennu, for those of you that are already registered and really enjoyed marking Bennu, because I know you exist, uh, yeah, Bennu's back up. I don't know how many images are left right now. There were less than 200 and some. There was some craziness yesterday where we asked everybody to stop marking images. Um, you can mark images now. 174. That number is actually probably not correct because I don't know if we've done the... I don't know if we've done the wipe of blanks and duplicates. Mike Cassidy, so people are like, people enjoyed it? Like, yes, I've had people asking me when they can mark more Bennu. I I would have thought y'all would have been happy to be done, but I guess not. People were asking when they can mark more Bennu. Not joking. <sighs> Susie Susie says people have literally been begging for more Bennu. Yes, this yes, this is the truth. I thought you would have all been happy to just be done with it and just done, but no, no. People have been literally begging for more Bennu, and I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Why? Why? So, yeah, 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 yeah. There's more Bennu up for those of you that are already registered. We're not allowing new people to register. Um, if you want something a little less intense, the moon is also available for mapping. It is way less intense. I actually find it kind of calming and peaceful and it's not, it's not Bennu. It's not Bennu. <laughs> and he says they want to know every inch of it so they can recognize it if they see it later. I guess that's the only thing I can think of is that people really want to know for sure what it looks like. So is there a sheet showing how many when marked on this new issue of images? No, we're still using the old um, leaderboard. I don't, there's no easy way to, um, there's no easy way to separate the old marks from the new marks this time around. Um, so yeah. Yeah, because like, I was testing yesterday and I just clicked submit image a bunch of times and it has a bunch of, uh, it has a bunch of like blank images still in my account. So we, we're gonna wipe those on a semi-regular basis just to make sure that there's images in the queue that have marks. So yeah, um, 
no... I mean, you can use the leaderboard to track your progress, um, but there's, like, no additional rewards for this phase. Okay, so... Um, there we go. There we go. I actually just got the, the text from the kind lady who's, I guess, part of the escape lab. So, yeah. Let me open that up for you. Oh, my. Okay. Um, oh, wow. Here's the most up-to-date schedule in Eastern Time. 2.40 intro AI Research Week with IBM Cambridge Director. 2.45 interview with ISS Program Scientist David Brady. 3.10 interview with astronaut uh, Richard Leinhen. We just added the first two, so feel free to co-stream what you have time for, had planned. So yeah, that's what's happening. So now we have less than an hour. All right. Um, yeah, and as Starshire said, we uh, removed images, submitted blank and duplicates, and we'll regularly remove these. So I think we're planning every night or every other night. So if you just want to look at a bunch of images, you can do it. Just if you plan on doing it, let us know so we know for sure to go in and wipe. But just mark Benu. We will for sure, for real, have the celebration stream of being done once this batch is done. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's all I have for now. I really do need to eat something before I'm back on here streaming again. And yeah, so I will be back in probably, oh gosh, 30 minutes. And I will see you all then. Um, I already did the wall of text. So reminder, please go subscribe to our YouTube. And we archive literally everything there. I am looking for the thing. I am looking for the thing. I find it ironic that I've been on top of rolling the credits for Pamela like all this week and this and for to me I've I've just been slacking all right so with that um I will see you all in a little bit and yeah wherever you are in the world have a wonderful insert time of day here uh thanks for the sub conversion Maria Rose I don't I have like this much Cheerios left hey Puck hey Tink Puck Tinker! Cheerios! Well, the Cheerios are on the floor. Oh, thanks for the follow, um, RL Portal. Uh, when the Cheerios are there on the floor, when the dogs come back, they'll find them. So yeah, I will see you all in a little bit. And yeah, I'm gonna roll the credits and I'm gonna sneak away. Thank you so much for tuning in and all that other wonderful fun stuff. Roll the credits and bye, see you in a bit.